Welcome to our session on Miro on Miro. Today, we're going to be meeting some people from our team at Miro. We call ourselves Mirineers and hearing from how they use Miro in their roles. I'm Paul Darcy. I'm the head of marketing at Miro, and I feel really lucky to be leading this session. It's a really fun topic, and every year, the audience always says this is one of their favorites. As members of the team here at Miro, we have a really special opportunity to use the product all day long, and it's baked into our culture at a very fundamental level. And because of that, my experience has been that there's a really different energy to collaboration and the way we work than a lot of other places that I've been during my career. So I'm really excited to introduce our presenters, and I know they're thrilled to be here. So first up, we have Pete Lim, and Pete is an Agile coach here at Miro, and he's going to share with us some of the ways that he uses Miro as he consults with teams across our company to help them improve their workflows and bring operational excellence to their work. Welcome, Pete. Thanks, Paul. Uh, I'm Pete Lim, and as Paul said, I'm an Agile coach here at Miro, and my team of coaches were all part of a larger team called People Solutions. We deliver solutions that help individuals and teams thrive at Miro. In order to help us continue to grow our collaborative culture and um, as the company scales, uh, continue to help teams be more effective. When I first joined Miro, uh, one of the first things that I did was I asked my manager, what's one thing that I can learn uh, in order to start making an immediate impact? And what he said was, how to Miro? So I didn't understand that at the time, but what I came to understand is it's kind of like having our own language. Um, in order to be able to work with others, in order to communicate my ideas, we have to be able to do all of that through the strength of our product. Uh, that's just the way that we all do it. So I've also got to say that before I joined Miro, I was a customer and we were primarily using it as a brainstorming tool uh, for things like um, story mapping uh, and with our product and engineering teams mostly. So when I joined Miro as part of our people team, it really expanded what I came to understand is what's possible using the product. And I also have to say that since I joined, I've been completely wowed and inspired by the things that my team, uh, my people solutions team have been able to create uh, and continue to create every day. So I'm really happy to have the opportunity to share some of the different ways that I see our team using Miro to support our internal teams uh, and our culture as we scale. So how we Miro, it all begins with onboarding. So our onboarding team, which is part of my People Solutions team, uses Miro extensively in our onboarding program for, uh, for new Mariners. So on the very first day, Mariners participate in a live interactive Zoom meeting. That session takes place on a Miro board and um, it has all of the information that a newcomer could possibly need and, and things specific to their hub. Then after that, they take part in a bunch of other live interactive Zoom meetings throughout the course of the next couple of weeks and they play games, um, they connect and find out more about each other. They of course learn about the product um, and all of that's done again in, in Miro. So it's their first exposure to the product um, and it's, it's meant to, you know, kind of help them get a sense of belonging and ramp up all while using that, uh, all while using the product. Another thing that this, uh, this pod has created is a welcome on board template that's for managers. And that helps newcomers, uh, understand what is the team identity? What's the working styles that exist on the team? What is their roles and responsibilities? And of course, where to find information because in the first couple of weeks, you have no idea where anything is or who to contact. So all of that's there for you. What I have on this slide, which is super tiny, but it's okay, I just want um, to share kind of one of the activities that our onboarding pod does uh, as part of those, those interactive sessions. This is how we introduce Miro values to our newcomers. You can see on the left side, um, this first column is our values, and then it breaks down into something we call the Miro behaviors rubric, where then we have examples of what those values look like in practice from nov novice all the way to expert. So then we would have people dot vote um, in kind of a self-assessment to see where do they place themselves on the scale of novice to expert in each of these behaviors. 
And what they'll find is there are obviously opportunities um, to lean in more or to learn more about each of the behaviors and values. So that's just one way that we use Miro um, to help our newcomers get acquainted with the values. The next example that I want to share, um, you can see here, this is from our company enablement pod. And it's one of my favorite ways that we use Miro. And this is to create virtual meeting spaces for the various communities that we have. So we have a lot of employee resource groups, we call them ERGs, that support diverse communities within Miro. And these groups then will use boards or design their own boards to share things with each other. Um, they source uh, topics for discussion uh, and all of it happens on Miro boards. So you can see on the left, this image here is actually a Zoom background that our brand team created for one of our ERGs. And they had a bunch of Zoom backgrounds that if you went to their board, you could download to celebrate their heritage month. And this um, month they were uh, celebrating the histories, cultures, and contributions of people whose ancestors came from Spain, Mexico, the Caribbean, uh, Central and South America. And they wanted um, people other marinaires to be able to participate with their community in a unique way. And I, I think they really did that. So if I zoom in here, you can see uh, some examples of some activities that they had people um, do when you come to their community board. They included their favorite Latin Peloton workouts, their favorite Netflix shows. And this was awesome. They created their own bingo board so that you could go in and see all of the activities that were happening that month and check them off as you go. It was a great way to, uh, again, be immersed in what was happening for the Heritage Month. And then here's another cool example that came from our Black Excellence ERG. And we do a lot of icebreakers in Miro, as I'm sure a lot of you do as well. Um, I am of the opinion that icebreakers should always kind of help ease people into discussion or content. And I think they did a really good job here in one of their meetings, they, they created this activity called Dinner Party. And people would select uh, different notable Black individuals to attend their dinner party um, and share that. And then that, of course, created a bunch of discussion. So I thought that was super fun. And I'm definitely stealing that one. So what I'm showing you now is a template from our Thriving Hubs pod. So this pod is dedicated to supporting thriving hubs as we continue to expand with initiatives that keep employees engaged locally. So I recently intended, attended a hackathon that was organized by my teammates in this pod that really was designed to help people brainstorm and collaborate on ideas to improve our office spaces and to help them feel like our own. Um, I am in San Francisco and so I had never been to the San Francisco hub, it was really exciting for me to be able to come up with ideas and help design what that space would look like when we return. So what I'm showing here, again, is a template that our pod created on a Miro board that was designed to organize any kind of hackathon, including the one that I just mentioned. So if I show you a little closer here, you can see this was the sign up form where you could sign up for a team. And the entire board looked like this, where there was directions on the left. There was about the uh, a little about section for the judges, all of the signups here. There was an activity um, that here was that was designed for people to understand what other um, types of work styles existed on their team, since a lot of them probably didn't know each other. And of course, then people could also vote for submissions all here on the narrow board. And uh, last but not least, my pod. So we are a team of coaches uh, and learning designers, and we are kind of tasked with helping empower teams to do their best work at Miro. And that often means running workshops and also facilitating discussions that build identity and connection. And they um, are meant to help people improve through retrospectives, to align on strategy and vision, agree on team norms, uh, fine-tuned practices and processes. So like all of the pods in our People Solutions team, what we create to support these other teams at Miro, it's all done from start to finish 
within Miro. So that means we do things like goals mapping, we capture research that we do um, about the ideas that we have, we brainstorm additional ideas there, we design our outlines and then the content all on the same board, we solicit feedback from other people, uh, all, again, all on the board. And of course, the finished product is often a Miro board to provide information or sometimes just uh, like as a template, as you've seen, to be used by teams as a collaboration space. So if you look here, I will show you an example that we've taken from one of our workshops for team building. And we have something called team player cards that we created on a Miro board um, that you can actually create kind of like your own baseball card, uh, your profile that has your role, what you value, your work styles, responsibilities, ways that your teammates can help you, things that they might misunderstand about you, um, how to leverage your strengths, all of that kind of stuff. And that's a great, again, kind of icebreaker, but it, it really helps teams, teammates get to know each other. I've got a few other examples on here. This one was uh, an activity that we created to help people explore what values exist on the team, how they can, um, how they rate themselves in, do those values currently exist on the team? What can they do to lean into them more? And then we've got this example over here. And this is about team agreements and norms. So you can see they will list out all of their different uh, rituals uh, and process, and then think about, you know, how is that working for them so far? Uh, do they want to change something about it? How can they make it better? Um, and then the agreements, again, get captured here on the board so that they can refer back to it and hold each other accountable. Another thing that I do in my role here is training. Um, I'm constantly talking about new concepts and frameworks that help people, again, be more effective. And this particular one that I'm showing you now, um, this one I did for something called VMUG, which is our virtual Miro user groups, uh, part of our, our extended community. And they had asked me to come in and just talk about agile practices. And specifically, they wanted me to help them understand about um, iterative product development. So rather than just go through a bunch of boring slides, I instead created an interactive activity using Miro where people would role play. We had people role playing as a product uh, manager and a bunch of people role playing as customers. And they broke off into groups. And then they were tasked to create the ultimate candy bar together by going through various options. So um, for example, maybe they have a dark chocolate candy bar with butter and bacon and uh, sprinkles. And it's also organic. And so they would get feedback from customers and in real time. And that's how a product should work as well. We should always be getting feedback from our customers in real time. So we know if we're building something awesome or something disgusting, like a butter and sprinkles and bacon chocolate bar. The last thing that I wanted to share with you here is I've, I've shown you a lot of stuff that we do kind of internally to help other marineers, but of course we also use the product just to help our own teams with like the day-to-day -day planning, prioritization, alignment, all that kind of thing. So you can see here um, the various ways that we have used Miro for our own team. We create jam spaces in order to collaborate and ideate. We use boards to share information to align better with each other and across all of our other teams, which is of course extremely important as we scale and more teams continue to grow to grow in, in other hubs. Um, we also use boards to do things like big room planning and also long-term planning. What are those big rocks out in the distance, the big projects that we know are coming? We have boards that we post our sprint demos to and get feedback from our other fellow team members and other pods there. We leave appreciation for one another on our team Miro boards. And we document our team norms and agreements, which you saw an example of in that, uh, in that workshop template, all on our team board. So what our team board can look like, you can see an example here on the right, a team huddle board. Um, I'm not going to zoom in here. This is meant just for you to see the different uh, things that we might add to a team huddle space. So we have like our plans and strategy here. We do all of our retrospectives here and capture that. We have all of our team building activities and team norms all captured here. What you don't see is we also capture data 
uh, on, the, on this team board as well. So if we get insights when we work with other teams, we capture them here. Um, so there's, there's lots of stuff you can do and it's all in one space. Um, another thing that we do to align across pods again, which is very uh, important as we continue to grow, um, is this po pod biweekly sync template that we came up with. And you can see it's just communicating initiatives that the pods worked on for the week, things we're gonna work on for the next week. If we have any risks or blockers, um, F FYIs for other pods. And of course, Mero lets you have a little bit of fun too. And we always have a pod meme of the week. Um, that's really the beauty of Mero is it's not just about connecting, uh, about work, uh, about planning, about alignment. It's also uh, about how you connect as people. So that allows us to you know, have fun together, collaborate, give appreciation, the things that build stronger relationships on the team that's just as important as all of the tactical stuff that you do. So I hope that these examples that I shared with you give you some inspiration for using Miro in other ways than just the things that maybe you do now, whether it be story mapping again or uh, brainstorming. So uh, thank you for uh, attending my talk and I will turn it back over to Paul. Thank you so much, Pete. Those were great examples. Uh, like we do use icebreakers all the time in the organization. The team player cards is one that's really familiar and it's so great to get to know people. I remember doing that on my first day of work at Miro. And I also really, really like the Black Excellence Dinner Party, which is something that I would have loved to have participated in or like to replicate for our team. That was a really great way to just get to know people and to create discussion that's really different from what normally happens at work. So next up, we have another brilliant member of our team, and that's Iris Latour. Iris is our user insights lead. And she helps teams across our business learn from and really, you know, brings empathy um, to, to how we understand and better serve our millions of users around the world. And so welcome, Iris. Thank you so much, Paul. So I'll go ahead and share my screen as well. Um, and it was super fun to see uh, all of Pete's amazing uh, work using Miro within the, the people team. Um, so I'm really excited to talk about how we Miro within um, conducting research uh, projects and, and leveraging um, Miro for uh, creating insights, developing insights, and then sharing them across the organization. So just really briefly, my name's Iris. Um, I'm on the customer insights team. Um, I'm an educator at heart, although I focus a lot on research, uh, design thinking, and I've actually used Miro since real-time board day. So I've been using it for several years now um, and just continue to explore and discover new ways to, to leverage it, um, which is just super exciting. So I'm, I'm happy to share some of the ways that uh, I myself and my team have, um, have leveraged Miro as well. I'm currently based in Rotterdam, the Netherlands. So the idea behind customer insights at Miro, uh, we like to say that we're keeping our finger on the customer pulse. And so what this means is that we're learning about our customer, but we're also constantly curious. We're learning about how our customer's experience is uh, changing over time, how they perceive Miro, what their expectations are, what the user experience as well. So kind of having that global picture and then taking that understanding and really empowering um, our Miro nears um, to leverage that understanding um, in order to create a, a better product experience and a, a better user experience. So research and insights, as you can tell, is, is very important um, in order to achieve that goal. And I'm going to touch on something that I think is Miro's secret powers, their secret sauce. Um, Miro allows us to make interactions more interesting and engaging. So workshops, facilitation, etc., while also at the same time creating living iterative assets. The moment you get on a board together, the moment you capture notes, it will live on the board and can take on its own life. Um, and as someone who's facilitated a lot of in-person workshops, that's always been a, a big pain point. So Miro kind of releases you from that. Um, so what I'm gonna talk to you about today is kind of these three phases uh, where I've leveraged Miro in uh, primarily research projects, I'll talk about a few projects around creating personas, um, understanding our audience better, 
Um, and so you can kind of see how we do that. So the three stages will be the prep phase, um, gaining alignment, preparing for the project, making sure you're set up for success, then actually conducting the research, how to engage participants, how to keep stakeholders uh, aligned throughout the project, and then finally sharing and enabling. And so this goes beyond just delivering those insights, but really how can they take on a life of their own so that folks can continue to learn and uh, engage with them as they, um, as they grow over time. All right, so shifting into prep. So this is how I see uh, leveraging Miro allows you to really set your project up for success. So there's tons of preparation work that goes into setting up for a project. Um, some examples I have here are, you know, maybe you're running the project internally, doing research internally, or you're partnering with, with a, a research vendor and leveraging Miro to kind of set up criteria and have folks uh, vote or rate different um, different vendors is something that we've done in the past. And you'll see it's very clear using color coding uh, to be able to rank and rate um, and really gain alignment around that. Another thing is also just keeping stakeholders um, uh, aligned on an understanding of what you're moving toward. So as you're setting up your project, uh, defining that timeline, how long is it gonna take? What role will you play? When will we need your input? Doing that all in one place on a Miro board is super helpful. And so you see, I have this little, we are here sticky note um, that we kind of uh, moved along as that project uh, moved from phase to phase. So this was a really exciting time because this was our, our final delivery phase. Um, another great part about using Miro for preparing for research is allowing space to really set expectations on those roles and the goals for the research, setting the boundaries um, for what folks should expect. Um, so here we did a, a, a quick workshop before our uh, personas research where we asked stakeholders, what do you think are some barriers to success? What are your hopes and dreams for how you might leverage these insights? Um, what are some ideas that you have on how to use those results? And then by having different subject matter experts and different stakeholders add their ideas here, um, those expectations and those goals went actually beyond what I might have been able to define on my own. So actually getting those ideas from other people and incorporating them on the board um, allows you to really elevate the project um, as a whole. So some of the, uh, the features, integrations, templates that I'd like to call out uh, that have been really helpful. There are a few templates around team alignment. There are some roadmap templates as well, as well that you'll find in our um, templates repository that really help you kick off um, so that you have that structure there in order to really input those ideas and, and get those inputs from your different team members as well. Some great features I think are tables. It's kind of like pulling a spreadsheet onto Miro that's really flexible and visual and beautiful. Um, another great one is voting, having folks come onto your board, vote on those different ideas, maybe using dot voting to, um, to kind of rank and rate uh, like I showed in that first slide. And then another integration that I really like is um, Google Docs where you're uh, able to bring, maybe you have a research brief that you've put together and you wanna have everything in one place, allowing you to bring that onto the board, um, just allows you to kind of have a, a really great overview of that plan, of that process before you actually kick off. So moving into the during stage while you're conducting the research, while you're developing those insights, it's really about designing a, a super engaging experience. Um, I think using Miro has kind of opened my eyes in understanding how the um, interview relationship can really be elevated and, and um, developed into something really fun and, and interactive. So this is an example of an a interview board that we created where we put together a, a game. We kind of gamified the uh, the interview experience. So instead of just sitting face to face with our interviewee, um, we added this element of having them come onto the board. So while they were talking to us and answering those questions, they were also adding um, onto the board. What skills did they use at work? Um, how do they feel about using Miro? What is their confidence level using Miro? And so even though they were saying things, uh, the, the visual element told us a lot as well. And we can kind of watch and see how confident they were too. So it helped add these multiple dimensions to what we were able to learn in that research session. I think this is kind of the, the meat and potatoes of, of that Miro superpower that I was talking about. Um, I cannot tell you how often I've 
stood in front of a whiteboard just covered in sticky notes and had to organize. They get blown off um, by the wind and then you have to start all over again. What Miro allows you to do is over here to the left, you'll see all these different insights, these notes as we're taking um, from, from those interviews and, and gathering from surveys, et cetera. And then it allows you to move into grouping and synthesis and then gleaning insights from that, developing how might we use, uh, making hypotheses around uh, ways that you might problem solve, et cetera, using tags to organize so that things feel a lot more structured, um, out of, structured out of that chaos. Um, so that's something that I think has just really elevated the way that we conduct research at Miro. So a few templates that we have here as well, a research template, and it just allows you to get kicked off with, with organizing things in a really um, uh, manageable way. Some of the features as well, you might have seen in the other slide, lots of comments, right? So folks who are conducting the research might be taking notes. You can invite stakeholders to look at those and leave comments. You can invite people to come in and leave reactions so that you're not just in the thick of it, in the weeds doing the work, but you're really bringing stakeholders um, along the journey with you. And then some integrations. Uh, the clusterizer is, is something new that we've launched at Miro recently, and it's really helpful with kind of clustering different ideas. So I, I recommend trying that out. Um, there's an awesome tutorial for how to do that. So the last stage um, that I wanted to talk about is this post stage. And I feel like a lot of times when you conduct research, there's so much work that goes into it, so much preparation, um, so many insights, so much feedback that you deliver it and I don't know, it doesn't feel quite as satisfying or it might feel like it's not getting incorporated the way that you might want it to. With Miro, you're actually allowed to help teams leverage those insights and really make sure that you're empowering them and enabling them to understand um, how to use them. And this can be done in both self-serve ways. So asynchronous, you put everything on a board and people can kind of go through um, an adventure of consuming those insights or you do it in, in a workshop setting. Um, so I have both examples here. So this is an example of a project where we um, put the final product on a Miro board. Over here, you'll see this notes section. And within Miro, you can actually activate the notes section so that it pops up whenever someone comes onto the board for the first time. So they have this nice welcome message. It describes to them what they're seeing on the board. Um, I don't know if you can see this, but there's, where am I? What is this place? So it kind of helps people feel uh, like they're not just overwhelmed seeing all the content there, but you're taking their hand and kind of um, hold, holding their hand as you're guiding them through that experience. So even though everything is on one board, they're still able to kind of follow the thread and learn things one bite at a time. Um, what I've also activated for that same board was a comment section. So folks could leave comments. Um, you'll see here a couple of people were doing spell checks for me. Uh, people were asking questions. Um, people were asking for um, a, you know, a, a being able to access content so they could do their own deep dive. So it allowed for this Miro board to not just be a, um, a stationary asset, but to really grow and develop and improve over time. And then the last thing that I'll mention about this, this post-research uh, post um, phase is when in doubt, gamify. I love using Miro in workshops, in facilitation, in uh, share outs, because it's really, really fun and really, really interactive. So to the left, this is an example of um, a workshop that I put together um, to allow for ongoing training. So I just took these visual cues, I brought people onto the board, um, we showed them screenshots of different boards that were used uh, for developers. So this is kind of the, the target audience that we were looking at to just help our teams understand how developers like to use Miro. Um, so it was really fun and interactive. Uh, what, what might have seemed overwhelming at first with just a lot of content, like I mentioned before, it allowed for folks to go through the experience and really learn bit by bit, and then also understand where they were confident or where they might have been less confident and how they wanted to engage with the material. At the very end of this um, scroll, you'll also see a section with a bunch of sticky notes. This was my opportunity to kind of test how folks were, what folks were learning from the content, how confident they were about understanding this use case, how, um, how they might leverage this knowledge uh, moving forward. And so this was helpful feedback for me so that I could go in and improve this over time as well. 
And of course, just creating games. Um, this is an example of a game where I had people vote on the different stickies. So I don't know if you can see, um, we wanted people to uh, to understand some of the, the research insights that we'd, um, that we'd gleaned from a survey. Uh, we found out that people use Miro for many different use cases, not just one use case. So I had people kind of go in and guess, right? And then you're able to see uh, what people are, are voting on. And I think most people actually guessed right on this one. Um, but that's awesome. Miro users uh, use Miro for around five use cases, which is fantastic. Um, so just a, a way to make things fun, interactive, and that really stays in the mind of people so that they're not just going in and, and self-interpreting the content, but um, kind of uh, getting competitive, uh, really excited to learn about it, and excited to answer the next question. Oh, sorry about that. So some of the templates that you might use here. Um, we have some awesome presentation templates. Um, I actually use a presentation template for today. So it allows me to kind of not have to worry too much about the structure um, of, of what I'm putting together, but I can just focus on the content. Um, so when you're sharing out ideas, having something that allows you to just focus on getting those insights in front of people is, is super helpful. Um, some features, emojis is what I used in that game. I had people voting using emojis. Um, PDF uploads. That's what I used on the self-serve Miro board where I just uploaded the PDF so people can read through it and they don't have to click on links to exit the board and then come back. Um, using the Confluence integrations too allows you to really put things all in one place. So thank you so much for listening. I'm super excited to, to share how, uh, how we use Miro for conducting uh, research projects and sharing out insights. Thank you, Iris. That was that was really really wonderful. Um, and there's a whole bunch of things that I really loved about your sharing. I love first of all attending the sessions and meetings that you lead in our our broader organization. Um, and I think they're great examples of whenever we come together as a group, whether it's a small team or in a bigger session or even our all company meetings. Like there's just this. We try to work to make it engaging, interactive, and we talk a lot about how we co-create together. And so as opposed to just presenting and listening, we all are jumping in and doing things. And I think it's one of the really special things that makes time engaging, even during kind of this hard pandemic era where we're just distributed and apart. And I also like you know, that you highlighted templates, which is one of the things that just makes it easy for anyone to jump in and get started and do this for a meeting without having to build up something that might take hours to do. So thank you very much for that, Iris. Our next presenter is Melissa Leem, who is our lead for enterprise product marketing. And Melissa is going to show us how the product marketing team runs a monthly meeting that we call Product News um, to inform all of our go-to-market teams. So that's like sales and customer success on upcoming releases and launches. And so it's a really good behind the scenes look at how this whole meeting is planned 100% asynchronously with a team that is spread across four time zones. So Melissa, we're excited to, 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 to see that. Thank you so much, Paul, for the introduction. I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen. And Iris, uh, yes, always so great to see how you build your boards. I know our team benefits a lot from uh, the work that your team does, like the persona research most recently. Um, and those are always great to have as a reference so that we're always really centering on the customer. Um, but hi, everyone. My name is Melissa, and I lead our enterprise product marketing team. And today I'm going to give you a behind the scenes or BTS look at one of the ways our team actually uses Miro. So I personally always get really excited about Distributed every year. And when I heard that uh, this year we were going to have a user conference, it really made me look forward to it even more. So I actually wanted to share a little bit of my story. Um, and so like Iris and like Pete, I actually started using Miro uh, back in 2018. I needed to do customer journey mapping at my previous company, and that was across all these different teams. And we wanted to see all of the different touch points a customer would have with our teams and where those handoffs would actually take place. So I led the workshop and I started uh, quite literally on a whiteboard on a wall and then graduated to a full whiteboard wall because I just ran out of space. Um, so even more, that wall was directly behind where I had sat in the office and 
anyone that wanted to actually take a look at the wall and the work that we were doing had to awkwardly stand right next to me and face the wall. Um, so it was quite an experience and I just felt like there had to be a better way. And that's how I stumbled upon Miro. At the time, it was called Real Time Board. So long story short, I love the product so much and I knew how to find a way to join the company. And so the timing was right. And I ended up joining the LA Hub six months later. So I've been here now for about two and a half years. So the product marketing team here is quite unique. Uh, like Paul mentioned, we do work across four time zones spanning a 12 hour time difference at its maximum. And there's kind of two branches of product marketing here. On one side, we have PMMs that are aligned to the different product streams. And that can be anything from core product to use cases to integrations. So things of that nature. And then on the other side, we actually have um, go-to-market PMMs. And so this really uh, aligns more closely to our go-to-market teams. And we really focus on externalizing things like positioning and messaging with things like solutions marketing and competitive intelligence. So in other words, some PMMs have that domain knowledge in a specific stream and they oversee very specific launches. And on the other side, we have a breadth of knowledge across all the product streams to really connect our brand and corporate narrative. Now, we know that one of the core responsibilities as a product marketer is to really inform and enable our go-to-market teams. And so that means we have to connect those features to values and really help others articulate how it'll make our customers' lives better. And so in the last quarter, we actually launched 20 features, believe it or not. And how do we make sure everyone stays up to date? That's where the monthly product news comes in. So it's a one hour meeting that happens at the top of every month. And for context, uh, we really wanted to start with the problem that we wanted to solve. Um, one thing that we noticed was that there really wasn't a single place where people could go to actually read about these product developments. So there were a lot of updates happening over Slack and email and direct messages. And the fact is, is that we were shipping very quickly. Like I said, we shipped 20 features in just the last quarter. And not all of the features are of equal weight. Sometimes um, some teams might need to know a little bit more about it. Other times it's really about, again, articulating that value to our customers. So some of the goals that we have for this product news meeting is first to really just share a high level digest of those new product developments and any corresponding launch plans. And then of course, just general enablement for the go-to market teams. And the other part is actually creating awareness of who's who on product marketing and product. Um, so we have grown from 300 Mironeers to over a thousand Mironeers in the last uh, year and a half. So you can imagine every single week we have a cohort of new Mironeers to welcome onto uh, into the company. And we always try to use this meeting as a way to establish a name to a face. A lot of the times when you're distributed and working across global hubs like we are, that really provides the connection and closeness in order to do our best work together. So like I mentioned, the primary audience really for this meeting is go to market. So that's sales, that's success, that's marketing. And they really need to be able to communicate the value of our product to our enterprise customers. And a secondary audience um, is actually the supporting teams that need to stay up to date on those product developments. So I know that one thing that always fascinates people um, is how we plan and build and actually rehearse for this meeting 100% asynchronously. And this can sound really risky, especially with a high stakes meeting like this. So we often have, you know, hundreds of people that are actually attending and it comes down to two things. It's both structure and scheduling and trust. So as you can see on this timeline, if I zoom in here, we have everything kind of laid out two weeks before, one and a half weeks before, the Friday before, the Monday before, Tuesday, and then the day of the meeting, and then one week after. So just like how Iris mentioned, they always start with templates. We do too. So after doing this for a couple of years now, we actually have a template that we've created. And every time we start, uh, we're not starting from scratch. So we create that board from a template. And one of the things that I think is important with product launches is that they're not just for the market and for customers. We actually have to think a little bit harder about our internal product launch. 
And so we think through what are some of those internal channels that we can create awareness for this product news meeting. So we'll add things uh, to the newsletter, for example, that goes out to the go-to-market teams. A week and a half out, uh, we're generally at a pretty good place where we can confirm the timeline with all the various PMMs. And then from there, we actually assign volunteers for different roles during the meeting. Um, this is something I'll touch on in just a little bit, um, but we have people rotating in and out of different roles. So it could be anything from who's hosting the meeting for that month, who's playing the music, who's monitoring the Zoom chat. All of those uh, roles are actually very critical to make sure not only is the experience engaging and we can make sure people know how to participate, but it just creates ownership too over this meeting across this very large team. So of course, moving on from there, we have our drafts and our content due and we finalize them and time box them as well. And the Tuesday before, which is the day before the meeting, we go in and do a final content review with our team. And we actually do this through comments on the board and we'll resolve them as we get to a certain place. And then the day of the meeting happens and it's game time and we're on live. And one of the things that we try to really reinforce is this behavior of asking questions on the board instead of on the Zoom chat. So a lot of the times you'll see really great questions pop up in the Zoom chat, but once you're done with that Zoom meeting, it disappears. And whoever's facilitating the meeting has to go back in, copy and paste it, make sure it gets documented. This way, if we start on the board, everyone else can see it when you have hundreds of people on the board and they can actually at mention the specific people that need to answer. And so from there, a week after, we actually document all of these questions in Confluence, um, including the board link itself and also just providing um, some other context too as a supplement to the actual meeting. So let's get into the board tour. So as I zoom out here, you can see I've been on the same board all along, and this is a skeleton of what our product news looks like. So you'll see here, starting from the left, we have an icebreaker, and then we go into the introduction of the meeting, and then you'll see these colorful rectangles here at the top of each frame, and those are actually the product streams, like I would mentioned. Um, and we do provide some instructions when people are on the board. So we say, hey, if you have a question, add a comment on the board, at mention the right PMM and mark it in blue. So if I go in here, I'll start with the icebreaker. One thing that I think even Pete mentioned was that there's a way to make icebreakers really fun. And again, it's to help generate discussion. It's to get people warmed up. It's an icebreaker after all. So this is one that we actually used where uh, we broke everyone out into a breakout room. And the goal was to actually go through the features and identify which ones are real and which ones are fake. So you would take uh, one of the green stickies and either turn it red or just let it stay green. And so when your team is done, you actually can change the background color of your frame to that color there. So in a way, we're using this icebreaker not only for them to get to know one another, but to almost quiz them on whether or not they know our product well enough. And considering this is called product news, this is actually a meeting one of our objectives. And the other part too, is they're actually figuring out new features of Miro as well. So if I can scroll down here, you can see, if I zoom out maybe a little bit, you'll see that it says 10M. And the reason for that is because we were actually celebrating this huge milestone where we had uh, 10 million users back in December. So the icebreaker also tied in something that we wanted to celebrate, which was a company milestone. And I'm happy to report that since then, we actually have over 25 million users now that use Miro all over the world. And some of these fake features are actually now real features. Um, so it's really exciting to kind of go back over time and look at this and see that this is actually not up to date anymore. We can't say that it says 10M because some of these features are actually real um, at this point. So that's always so great for me to see as, as just reflecting on this in the previous product news. 
So as we go into the actual meeting itself, um, this is the actual introduction. And you can see here that uh, this is very familiar content. I just had this up here as I was walking through it. So we really want to communicate this to any new Mironiers, give them a reminder of who this meeting is for and what the goals are, and also what the agenda is. And like I mentioned, we have what we call Miro product streams here. And so these are just areas of focus of the product that our product development teams really mobilize around. So this, again, is a good piece of education for a lot of our new Mironiers. So if I can just zoom in um, on a certain example here on the board, um, we have this introductory uh, kind of initial frame for every single stream. And what we're doing here is we're showing, again, who is actually part of this stream, who should you tag in uh, any of the comments when you have questions. And when you see um, the next frame, you'll get a sense for how we start to uh, really reinforce our messaging and positioning and tying it back to some of the things that we're doing on the product side. So again, these are just examples. Um, these aren't uh, necessarily frames I took directly from our meeting. Um, but here you'll see at the top, the heading says, help everyone get the most out of Miro with a simplified board experience. So while there's many features um, underneath that are listed here, what really we need to articulate to customers is that we're really making sure that everyone can use Miro no matter what their skill level might be. And as I pan down on the board, you'll see that this is an example of one of the features that we actually uh, mentioned. This was actually one of the fake features that now is real um, around board history. And the anatomy uh, kind of behind this frame is you'll have a heading, you'll have some bullet points here to again, articulate what is the value and what are the next steps. And in the upper right here, you'll see the status of the actual feature. Um, so has it been released? Is it okay for me to communicate to my customers about it? And then some key resources, including a screenshot of the feature itself. So as I zoom out here, you can see that we've created this consistency across the entire board. And what this does is not only for structuring the content, but it actually creates the clarity of the information and helps people to retain the information as well. So with all that said, there's a lot of work that happens behind it uh, to get to that final um, place before we actually are ready to present. And one thing I love about our team is that we actually always celebrate after uh, the meeting takes place. So you'll see here an actual conversation that we had a month ago um, where we said, hey, we were only two minutes over. It's so great. Uh, all the comments that are coming in and all the hype in the chat. And you can just see a, a little bit of the personality of our team. Um, so although we were able to pull off 100% async work to do this product news meeting, we actually um, are still connected in this way. And so um, we always are kind of going into our own Slack channels and just giving kudos to everyone. And sometimes we actually iterate on things right then and there. So previously, um, instead of using comments, we actually used stickies on the board. And that actually worked okay for the time. Um, but as more people got on board, we really wanted to make it a little easier. So we started using comments. And then once we answered the comments, they would turn from blue to green. Um, and I asked actually, you know, one of our team members, you know, what, what makes product marketing able to pull off the fact that we can do this on time asynchronously and kind of adjust on the fly. And I just wanted to showcase this from Rebecca on our team. And she said, you know, the timing aspect is not only about owning the success of your part, but everyone's actually owning the success of the entire meeting. So if one teammate runs over, we leverage the Zoom chat to work through that in real time. And then we adjust from there. And really nothing ever runs exactly according to plan, but that real time flexibility and teamwork happens in the meeting is magic. So if you can get a sense of our team, this is um, how we operate. And so much of it is structure, but on the other side, it's always coupled with trust. 
So one of the questions I tend to get is, well, does it work? Um, how do you know people are engaged? How do you know people are prioritizing it? Um, how do you know people are really informed about what's happening in the life of the product? Um, and I can say that it does work. Uh, we do get some shout outs from specific people who say that product news was really great that day. We see people prioritizing this meeting and trying to figure out their schedules around it. Um, we have solutions engineers who use this product news board as a source of truth. So they're actually updating their own boards based off of the information we provide. We also see a lot of people just talking about it in general. There's a lot of evangelism saying, hey, the product news update was great. If you didn't catch it, make sure to watch it on demand. And then finally, for our go-to-market teams, we're creating a lot of awareness. And so you can see here that this particular person actually at mentioned two other people on our board and made sure that they were aware of some of the product updates. The other question that people tend to ask is, does this scale? Can you actually make sure that this is a process we can do over and over again as the company grows? And I'm happy to say, yes, it does scale um, because part of it is we documented the entire process. So we have here um, some steps like I showed you in the timeline that gives you a sense of what it is we're really trying to accomplish. And also, you know, our own team grew um, by 3x in the last year and a half. And so we've seen that this has worked over time. And on top of that, our go-to-market teams grew by almost 4x. Um, so again, when you have hundreds of people on a board, there are certain ways that you can facilitate that meeting so that they're getting the most out of it. And most recently, we actually handed off this entire thing to our launch program manager who joined a few months ago, and she was able to just take it on and is running relatively smooth, smoothly, even with the transition. So one of the things that I want to leave you with is uh, I hope this doesn't create the impression that uh, we were able to perfect this from the get go. There's definitely some tips I wanted to share with you. So the first one here is that you absolutely need to get buy in from your stakeholders. So we have it actually on the company calendar. And um, actually, last quarter, we noticed that the attendance rate wasn't growing as quickly as the number of people that were joining Miro, um, even though we saw them on the actual calendar invite. And so we got with the leadership team and involved them. And now this meeting is mandatory and prioritized. We really expect every Miro near to be able to watch and access this um, and preferably at the same time. So the other part that's really important for this meeting is, you know, it's only an hour long. You really need to determine what is newsworthy. So it is, in fact, called product news for a reason. So we now have to um, think through how do we tie the content that we share to things like the launch tier or the enablement tier? And if it doesn't quite make it, it gets cut or it's on the board and it's an async follow-up or read-up. So either way in, in each scenario, there are ways kind of around it to make sure the meeting stays tight and also relevant for the audience. Now you saw the example earlier, um, make icebreakers purposeful. You know, every minute counts in these meetings. So sometimes we use icebreakers as a pulse check to see how everyone's doing. Other times we're actually gathering data on whether or not our go to market teams are being enabled and they're aware of these product features. The other tip is share the load and be direct about it. So you really want to get people involved, but you really need to delegate and be direct about those responsibilities. So again, we have one person monitoring the chat, another person's dropping in the board link, another person's hosting the meeting, and we'll rotate these uh, roles through everyone so that everyone has a sense of ownership and then they can also sharpen their hosting and presentation skills. And finally, the audience experience matters. I cannot stress that enough. So it's not just for the sake of the experience, but we're optimizing for clarity of communication and retention of information. So the experience is really just the frame around the painting, so to speak. Um, it means that, you know, the host is ready five minutes before they have the music playing from uh, their computer and it's clearly uh, being heard. The icebreaker is already being shared on the screen for people to start interacting. All of this matters. And in fact, it's, it's part of what we actually focus in on when we do our retrospectives on this meeting. 
So it's been so great uh, to share this with you all. Thanks so much for listening. And please connect with me on LinkedIn. I think one surprise out of the pandemic is how popular QR codes are. So you can just QR code this and we can connect. Um, but with that being said, I'll pass it back over to you, Paul. Thank you so much, Melissa. One of the things I love is the is it real exercise that you do with the team so that like the one where you turn the stickies red. It's just such a great example of how to engage people and do so many things at once. Like you're connecting people in groups so that they get to know each other. It helps people really learn about the product and it's fun and it's just such a great way to interact. I also love the goal of product news to educate our team on how the features make customers work and lives better um, so that we can really have the impact that we're hoping to have with all of the changes and evolution on the product. So thank you, Melissa, for sharing that. And thank you to our other presenters, Iris and Pete. This was a ton of fun for me. I saw new things, which is great. And I hope it was helpful for everyone out there in the world. Since we showed you how we use Miro, um, you know, we hope you'll keep showing us how you use Miro. We love seeing screenshots and video of your boards. And we know that what our 25 million plus users do um, is so much deeper than what, you know, our thousand employees could ever share. And so keep on sharing it with us. We have a hashtag. It's hashtag distributed 2021. And, and we would love for you to use that to share some of your great work. Also, want to remind everyone that this session was recorded and you can find it online soon. Have a wonderful day and thank you for joining us today.